Hey there, Victoria here, and welcome to the Choose to Think podcast. I really appreciate how you take time out of your day to tune in. I'm glad you're here. And if you're like I am, you may be listening while doing dishes, driving, or as your day is winding down, but it's just great to have you. And if you have a moment, I would appreciate it if you would share your favorite episode on Instagram or Facebook, and be sure to tag me when you do. The podcast has now been heard in 17 countries and has passed over two thousand downloads. If you can partner with me to promote the show, it would really bless my heart. Also, consider joining the private Facebook community of listeners. Just search for the group called Choose to Think with the number two as a digit. I'd love to have you there. And if you would like to support the podcast with a small contribution each month, there's a listener support tab on Anchor that you could click to find out more. Be sure to visit my website, www.victoriadwalker.com for all all kinds of freebies and opportunities to get connected and stay in touch regularly. And I'm always, and I mean always, in need of your prayer support. Perhaps that means more to me than anything else. In today's episode, we'll take a look behind the scenes of a fully recovered former alcoholic. Pastor Helen Music of Lex City Church opens her heart for us as she shares her candid experience with overcoming addiction. If you've ever been caught in the headwinds of addiction, you know, everything from pornography, alcohol, other types of drugs, food, gambling, approval, shopping, you name it, this encouraging message may offer you a fresh line of hope as you are in perhaps the battle of your lifetime. Or if this message is not for you directly, I am quite certain that you know someone in your circles who would really benefit from this word. Please, please share the episode link with your loved ones and friends. Helen and I pull apart the mental anatomy of addiction, so to speak. That is the impact of the thoughts and attitudes that we may have regarding the addiction and the subsequent harmful or helpful behavior that these thoughts and mindsets may evoke. This is a message of surrender and victory all wrapped in one nice package. Now let's dive in. Welcome to the Choose to Think podcast, Helen. I am so excited to have you today. Thank you so much, and I'm excited to be here. We're just going to jump right in, and I would love you to share your story about how you've come to be an associate pastor at Lex City Church, but if you could kind of wind it back a little bit and maybe even start from the beginning, just like your life story, really, and your testimony, and what brought you from wherever you were born all the way to Lexington, Kentucky. Can you, and just whatever you may feel comfortable sharing. We, I, I would love to hear that. Well, I would love to share it. I uh, grew up in a military family, which if you have any listeners that understand that lifestyle, you move every two to three years. And that was an adventure for me. I didn't mind that at all. We were stationed overseas when I was in middle school. And it was there that I became actually a Christian. Uh, there was a s- small Baptist missionary run church and the pastor's daughter was my best friend. And we got in a lot of trouble together, but we also came to Christ on the same day together. So that's a pretty cool thing. Um, And it was really a dramatic experience for me. Even as a 12-year-old, I had a very tangible experience with Jesus. He was so real to me. His presence, which I had never known before, um, was just revealing to me the, the sin nature of my heart even at that age. And I knew I needed him like I needed air. And I invited him into my heart that night. And it was, it was like dark to light for me. It was a visceral experience. I couldn't think about it or talk about it for weeks without crying. Uh, Interestingly enough, my, the pastor, uh, my best friend's father. They went on furlough and came back to the States. And I was 
sort of left to a whole new peer group. And it was in that same year that I discovered alcohol. And uh, at a young age, 13, started experimenting with drinking. But it wouldn't be till later in my life that I came to understand really that what was kind of expiration and teenage adventure with drinking and stuff uh, that I really had the same disease my father and my uncles and other people in my family all had as well. Um, I went to seminary, felt a call to ministry. When I came out of the University of Tennessee, I felt called to go study. And so I came to Asbury Seminary. Um, I had kind of a dramatic experience when I was in college with the Lord walking home my freshman year year in college. I, you know, I gave my life to Christ when I was 12. I wasn't discipled. I was kind of living out in the world, so to speak. But when I went to college, the Holy Spirit started drawing me to his word. And I just had this insatiable desire to read it and just became more and more truth and light to me. And my freshman year in college on the way home from a fraternity party, I just, I knew the Lord was saying, you have to choose life or death. You have to choose, in other words, me or the world. And on that walk home from a fraternity party, I just said, Jesus, I'm in. And, you know, I, I, I know I gave my heart to Jesus when I was 12, but it's like I gave him my life <laughs> when I was 18, like meaning you've saved me, now use me. So that was just an amazing experience in college, went to seminary, and it wasn't until after seminary that I actually had another drink and things really um, changed for me then. Can, can I interrupt you just for a second? I'm wondering, after seminary, what prompted you to take that drink? Interesting enough, that's a great question. Uh, I was serving at my first church in South Carolina. And interestingly enough, it was a seminary friend, girlfriend, who came to visit. And she came for the weekend and she brought a bottle of wine. And I had never even thought about drinking, didn't have a desire at all. You know, I was, it was a part of my life in high school, but with that surrender when I was 18, never even thought about it. And it was like that glass of wine, that one glass of wine was like someone put a match on a can of gasoline. Wow. And so from there, Helen, was it, was it like, did I, you know, if you could unpack just a little bit and I want to be sensitive here and I want, I want to make sure that you feel comfortable sharing your story, whatever you are comfortable with, but because the, the, the road of addiction is, it's so extremely painful. And what, what was that like for you if the, if the if the match lit then what happened in your in your life at that point or even if we fast forwarded when did you recognize wait a minute i've got a problem here how what did that what did that look like how did that unfold my friend after that weekend she left and that whole week all i could think in my brain was I need to get a bottle of wine. And that just ran in my brain. And I was a youth pastor. And so I was thinking, where can I go that my kids wouldn't see me? They wouldn't be showing up as well. So I kind of schemed all week. And that weekend, I thought, I'll just get a bottle of wine and I'll just have a, a glass with my dinner. And so alone in my apartment, that's what I did that Friday night. But instead of just drinking the glass, I drank the whole bottle. And I remember as clear, like, you know, those times, Victoria, where the Holy Spirit is so clear, they're defining moments. I had a defining moment with him. I had what I would call a sober thought in the middle of a drunken stupor. 
His voice was clear, and he said, you have the same disease your dad had. You're no different. You can't do this. And I heard him. And so I didn't go get another bottle of wine the next week. As a matter of fact, I really didn't drink, but I knew I had this disease. And so then over the next 10 years, I would drink kind of socially, but the craving was insatiable. If I was going to a party where alcohol was, I would only drink. I could I could stop at two glasses of wine. But inside of me, there was such a turmoil and the Holy Spirit's presence saying, you cannot do this. I know other people can, but you can't. He kept telling me that. And I kept quenching him, even though... To look at me, you would, I, I never got a DUI. I never was sloshy. I never, you know, it was, it, I didn't drink every day. I had a, what we call in recovery, a very high bottom. I mean, I did not have to go down low to understand the power of addiction. And that really was the presence of Jesus in my heart, walking with me and just making sin uncomfortable, which is what he does. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role in our life is to convict us, John says, of sin. And so because of that, it was kind of like I I was afraid to go too far. I, I, I never bowed my knee to the idol and gave myself completely over, but I got close because at the end of those 10 years, I was making compromises in my in my life with regards to alcohol, um, you know, drinking a little more and uh, covering it up. And but again, the Holy Spirit just finally one night just I woke up and I had been to a party with my husband and I was 38 years old and he just said, I woke up in the middle of the night. We'd been to a party and I had had a little bit too much to drink. And I felt a presence that was so dark in my room. And I heard two words and the two words were, I'm winning. And I knew that was not the voice of love. And I woke up the next morning and that was the day that I had my moment of clarity. And I thought, I've got to, I've got to tell somebody. I've got to tell my husband and my brother and my sister-in-law that I think I might have a drinking problem. I know it doesn't look like it to you all, but I think I have the same disease my dad had. That kind of gave me the chills as I'm as I'm listening to you. Um, what a struggle that would be. And the enemy, of course, Wow, he was, you know, he's alive and well, right? And just firing those darts to be sure. How did you deal with like guilt and shame? Did did you have a, a were you carrying a lot of guilt and shame those years? Yes, I was, because with addiction, you make yourself promises that sound like this. I'll never do that again. Or, well, I would never do that, whatever that is that you hadn't done. So I remember one, only one time that I drank and drove. I said I never would do it and I did it. And you just find yourself making exceptions. And with that comes shame and guilt. Uh, Shame is not living up to the image that you think you should be. And the enemy uses that in a pretty powerful way because he tells you that what you did is who you are. It never transforms a heart. Guilt, as I understand it, is from the Holy Spirit highlighting sin that leads to repentance where you find kindness and restoration. But repentance is, you know, truly that didn't come until... I made a line in the sand now 23 years ago and said, all right, 
I'm not just admitting to myself I have a problem. And even to God, I am, I am bringing this out. You know, it says confess your sin to one another so you can be healed. It doesn't say confess your sin to one another so you can be forgiven. Only Jesus forgives sin. But it does say confess your sin to one another so you can be healed. And that part of recovery is essential. The first word of the 12 steps is a two-letter word, and it's a powerful word, and it is the word we, W-E. We admitted we were powerless. I had admitted, but it is in the context of community that I found healing. It was before Jesus I found forgiveness. But those two together then catapulted me into recovery. Those are very important points and clarifications. I'm wondering, how did your friends and family take it? What were their responses when you said, hey, you know, I, I, I do have a problem, especially since it may not have been as, you know, especially evident? Yeah, um, they were amazing. Uh, my um, brother, I, he wouldn't mind me sharing this, is in recovery as well. He had lots of years in this journey and he took me seriously because he understands that alcoholism is a, you know, a genetic and generational sin and disease and how it works. They didn't really question me. I mean, they really were going, if that's what you're sensing, we're here to support you. Because again, I had this high bottom. My addiction didn't cost me anything except it was costing me everything when it came to peace before Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit. So it didn't cost me my job. I didn't never got a DUI. It never cost me my health. But I remember being at one of my very first AA meetings and this woman said, this addiction is an elevator ride that only goes down. If you want, you can stay on this ride, but it will take you down and it will eventually take you to the bottom where it will take everything. Or you can get off now while you still have your health and your marriage and your kids' respect and your life. And I just thought, I am jumping off now. I'm getting off now. So you got off and the way you just worded that, it almost sounds easy, but I know it could not possibly have been easy or I I don't think so. So can you describe that process at the moment when you, you made that, you know, you knew it, that kid was kindled in your spirit. I want off. I am not willing to risk anymore. I want off this elevator that's going down. What did that process look like for you? And, and how did you, how did you get off? Was it, was it, did it start in your heart with your thoughts, with prayer? I know a part of it was confessing and, and allowing a community of believers to support you and shore you up. And then you've got the, the 12 steps and that sort of thing. But was there anything else involved in that? Or was it difficult, easy? How would you describe that? It was painful. Hmm. Because it it required humility, honesty, and willingness. And and there was shame with that. That's why it was painful because I just felt like, oh, like I'm an alcoholic. I remember just thinking, I mean, at first saying those words, it was, it was, it was riddled with shame. I felt like I had failed as a person of integrity. I had I had been hiding, um, I hadn't been honest, and all those things are true. I had done those things, but that's not who I was. So through counseling uh, with uh, an amazing woman who mentored me and was like a spiritual mentor to me, through counseling every week, I started unpacking that 
shame and and learning that's not who I am. It's what I did. And how, I tell you what I really had was a grace awakening. I had been working so hard to do everything for God right. And I just had this grace awakening that you, I mean, he was, his love was so real to me during that season of repentance and recovery. I was just going, you love me this much, even though I was doing that, like hiding and quenching your spirit. And he was just, I could feel his love closer than ever. And it was just, he was just showing me it's, it's, you never, you never became my daughter by doing anything for me in the first place. I did everything for you. That's how much I love you. So learn to run and dance and live in grace. And I really, I had a a grace awakening. It was powerful and it's still so powerful. I just, I have today, Victoria, I have no shame. That's why I'm going, yes, I'm happy to be on your podcast and talk about this. There's no shame. I I have joy in, in what God has done through this journey of mine and how he's exp- exposed a deeper level of his love and what relationship is like and what freedom looks like. So I'm like, oh my goodness, let me tell you what Jesus can do because the enemy was trying to rob all that from me. And maybe there's a listener today. And you're just compromising. You know, you've not bowed your knee completely to the idol of addiction, whatever it could be. Maybe you have. It is time to get up. It is time to get up. It's time to get up and turn, which is just repentance, and take the right next step. That is such a hopeful and inspirational word for someone. And it encourages my heart just to hear it as well. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Number one, it's free. Number two, there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Number three, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. A big part of my ministry is kind of unpacking and examining our thought life. As the Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive, um, it's, you know, that's for a reason. And we're to operate out of a renewed mind. And about four years ago, a friend of mine challenged me to to figure out what that really meant because I had dipped down into a bit of a depression and my thought life was, you know, you, you, you spoke a moment ago about the, the voices that we may hear or that those thoughts that kind of fly across our, our brain, our mind. And we can say, now, wait a minute, is, would God say that to me or who's saying that? And anyway, I, I began a process of figuring out what it means to take thoughts captive, of course, with God's help and the Holy Spirit right there beside me. It wasn't in my own might that I'm, that I'm even sharing this. That's just an understood kind of thing. But um, anyway, that took me on a journey to really carefully examine my thoughts. And it was so delightful to realize that I got to choose what to think about. And then it was equally delightful to me that I got to choose my emotions and my feelings. They don't just happen to me. I used to think that mood swings were just a part of life. That's just like normal. And then I realized that no, wait a minute. I, what am I thinking about that's kind of causing this emotion right now? And so anyway, I went on a, a pretty big adventure to try to uncover all of that, which is in part why I'm here today with this podcast, just to kind of encourage folks that we really we really can choose to think and we can pay attention to our thoughts, which lead to our emotions and then consequently often leads to our actions. And if we're, if we're 
you know, if our thoughts aren't rooted in love, God's love, then gosh, they may be rooted in fear or, you know, there are a lot of roots that, that could have residence there and that don't bear good fruit. So, and, and I don't know if any of this really makes sense, but what I'm trying to say is if we could put that kind of dynamic onto overcoming addiction, what what were the thoughts that you might have been having? Or let's say you had this urge or a craving for a drink. What how did you how did you combat that um mentally? Or had you ever thought about that? Or like with your thoughts, were you more aware of what you were thinking? And did you use your thoughts and to to help you in that? fight as you were, you know, after you got off the elevator and then you're, you're in, you know, the pain of that, that you experienced and then day after day after day, you're resisting. What did your thoughts have to do with that? Does this even make sense, Ellen? It makes great sense. And I appreciate you sharing um, your experience and the hope that that brings to lots of people, because it really is a battle for the mind. And, and it's very real, even, I mean, I appreciate the work that's out there now that helps us understand the wiring of the brain and the way God made it and that we can rewire our brain with replacing the true thoughts, not the dark thoughts, the light thoughts, not the dark thoughts. And, but understanding for me that my brain was hardwired to to trigger or to literally tell me uh, it's five o'clock in the afternoon, it's time to have a glass of wine while you make dinner. Like it, it, it was wired that way. And I had to renew my mind and say, actually, you don't get that uh, anymore. And you now are going to, um, choose to be present and choose the truth that you are free and that this is not what will bring satisfaction. So that, you know, that's a little bit of it. I mean, uh, I don't know if that makes sense or speaks to what you're talking about. I mean, the on does. does. Yeah. Yes, it does. And it's a great example of how, you know, the, the wiring of our brain and the, if you had that thought, okay, it's five o'clock and I'm going to have a glass of wine, you, the resistance came in the thought that you rejected that thought, you recognized it, Mm -hmm. then you resisted that thought and then you replaced it with what exactly you would do instead and who you were and the freedom you were walking in. You used God's truth essentially to steer you in another direction. The hard part is that you have to do that day after day after day after day. It takes a while to to build up that that new habit. I mean, I suppose some people for for me at least it was I fight hard even today to to take those thoughts captive, examine my thought life, make sure that I'm I'm being led by God's truth, not by my own flesh or a worldly concept or the enemy, but instead that I'm being led by God. I fight really, I feel like I fight hard, not that I'm striving because I remind myself often, you know, the battle is the Lord's, but I make a big point out of, out of, resisting and then uh, replacing those thoughts. And that's really exactly what you did. And I don't know, was that, I always, I'm always amazed at how people, for me, it's been, it's, it's, I would say it's hard in ways, or it's, I'm challenged by that. And I accept the challenge. I'm, I'm grateful to have the awareness that I, I can fight back. And I, there is a choice here. I'm very grateful that with, you know, God tells me that I can scale a wall. And so, you know, figuratively, so that brings me great joy and it gives me comfort, but it's still kind of hard. So I don't know if, if there were days, you know, one day after another that when five o'clock rolled around that you were, you, you kept resisting until one day you didn't, or whether it was just an automatic thing for you. I'm always fascinated to know how people 
you know, when they're replacing their thoughts, how that process is or what that's like, what that was like. Do you remember that? Well, I'm 23 years into this journey. Mm-hmm. I love that we talk about doing it one day at a time because it really is one day at a time being and walking in obedience in your thoughts and in your actions. And I think because, you know, even for those people that are listening that think, how in the world could I ever do without blank, fill it in, whether it's, it's how could I ever live without believing I'm a victim or how could I ever live without the satisfaction of um, this lifestyle of promiscuity or, I mean, or drinking or food or whatever it is, you know, it's one day at a time walking obedient to the Lord. And, and what happens is you start to experience the blessing of obedience. So replacing, oh, why don't you, and I mean, 23 years, I'm still into this. I'll go on vacation and I'll see people having a margarita and I'm thinking, well, that would be nice. I will have that thought. Right. And then I will think, except it, it actually might be nice, but it won't lead to freedom. And I want the blessing of God in my life. I want that more than I want what my flesh literally wants right now. I mean, this is a, until we see him face to face, my experience is I'm in this battle always. I mean, do I have stronger muscles? I do. I don't, I won't have a drinking thought for a month. But then I walk into a restaurant and I see someone having a bottle of wine with their meal and I'll think, wow, that, that looks, that looks good. Then what do I do with that thought? That thought isn't a, that thought isn't sin. It's what I do with that thought that becomes sin or, or, uh, toxic. I may have that thought that, that looks like a great bottle of wine. must be nice to be able to have wine with your meal. There's the thought. Now, what do I do with that? Lord, thank you so much that I am free and you are with me and I can be present and I bring, you know, the cross of Jesus Christ against the enemy who wants to tempt me and rob from me. And I choose, choose to be present with you right now. And it's not easy. I mean, I'm not really, I mean, I struggle still. But what it has also done is brought me this connection to grace again and to compassion and empathy for others who struggle. I mean, I think I was a very judgmental person before this whole incident in my life. And now I just, the Lord has changed my heart because I, I just, I get it. I, I understand what it is to have a struggle and a temptation and give into it. And I understand what it is to choose to walk one day at a time and do the hard work we talk about at, at the recovery ministry, that real freedom takes real work. I mean, that's why the word is take every thought captive. It's a, it's a, it's a war word. You know, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities we don't battle. It doesn't say we don't hang out with, it's like a battle. This is and until we see him face to face. That's, there's a battle. But yeah. I'm gonna. I'm today. I'm gonna walk in obedience. Yeah, these are such inspirational, hopeful points that you're making, and I, I've kind of, I'm grinning over here because I think what you're saying in part is that, well, Victoria, you know, it's just the battle. The battle goes on. There's no uh, easy way out on this, and then it keeps going. It's it's kind of like I, I was looking for a. Uh, Will I discover something or learn something that is like, oh, an aha moment for me? And um, and maybe it's just not such a, a bad place to be knowing that I am in the battle and that God has me equipped. And I love the thought of the the 
I want to choose the blessing and I want to be present. That's such a, a, a profound thought that we can apply. You know what? I'm not going to go in that direction because I want to be present. I want to be right here, right now. Now, let's transition just a teeny bit over to the mat. And um, what is the mat and when is it? What could people hope to find there if they come to that community, that group meeting? Well, 15 years ago, I got an offer to start a recovery and freedom ministry at our church. And I remember when the pastor at that time asked me to start this, I really was kind of like, well, why would I do that? Like, like I was walking in such kind of freedom. I was like, I don't even, I kind of didn't really even think there was a need for something like that. But I I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but I was, so I went to the Lord and I was, I was like, well, Lord is, is this something you want me to do? Like start a freedom and recovery ministry? I mean, I know I'm a recovering alcoholic, but I'd never been a part of any kind of ministry like that. And, and I woke up the next morning and here was another, just one of those defining moments. I heard him or he kind of gave me gave me this vision, this impression in my brain and my heart, the best I can hear him. And it was it was the story in Mark chapter two. Four men carried a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't get to Jesus through the clay roof above his head, so they dug through the roof and they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. And the story goes on to say that Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said. Stand up, take your mat, and go on home because you're healed. And then I love the last part. It goes, uh, the stunned onlookers said, we've never seen anything like this before. And the impression from the Holy Spirit was, "This, this is a story of recovery, Helen. Call the ministry the mat. Have it based on the principle that there are places in people's lives where we cannot get to Jesus alone and we need mat carriers. But Jesus heals. Our, our, our job is to get them to him. He heals. And then you become a mat carrier. And when you get up and walk and people are stunned. So I was like, that is so cool, the mat. And I just knew I was called to this. So we started this ministry. And it really isn't just a recovery ministry. It is a place of freedom and recovery. Because honestly, I meet people who do great recovery work, but they don't walk in the freedom of Christ. And we knew that the two of those go hand in hand. It is the only true freedom and recovery. So we meet and have been meeting for 15 years. We've had groups from, I mean, everything kind of imaginable whenever the Lord brings a leader in an area and some some area of, of need for a habit or a hang up, we start a group. But but we meet on Thursday nights and of course now we're on Zoom. But you can go to lexcity.info on Thursday nights. You can scroll down to the bottom and it will say the mat freedom and recovery and you can click there and there's a join now. Now we're in the summer season so we only have groups meeting right now. We don't have our big group gathering which we'll have in the fall. But if you need support this summer in the area of substance abuse, any substances, alcohol, drugs, or you're a man who is struggling with sexual integrity and addiction issues, or a woman whose husband has those issues and you need the support of a community of other women, how to walk through this, or maybe you're struggling with food issues, um, you can go on to lexcity.info and the groups meet in the summer at 730 and it's confidential and great community and you're invited. 
That's wonderful to hear that. You know, I've I've been attending the mat now for, gosh, probably four years or so. And I just love those small breakout groups. First of all, I love the worship, the worship team, and and then the sometimes the test the teachings, the lessons, or the testimonials, and then to go into the breakout groups. It's it's just such a, a wonderful program. And I've really, really truly enjoyed that. And all the friendships that I'm making and and the the new folks. So it's it's been a, a lot of fun for me. Um, I was it was always curious to me how in that passage in Mark, you know, Jesus says, "Take up your mat and go home," mm-hmm. and and that it's recorded, "Take up your mat" several times, even in in the New Testament. And you know, when I think about that, I literally put myself in that scene. I'm like the that mat would be the very last thing that I would be thinking of once I was healed, healed. I would, it probably would be dirty. It, it, it would be, um, you know, I would just want to discard that altogether and I'm not going to pick it up and then take it back home with me. I'm not going to do that. But yet that was the admonition. And I've thought about that so often. I thought, you know, it's kind of like after Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord and he walked away with a limp. It was that reminder, a, a, a powerful reminder. It doesn't have to be a negative, but a powerful reminder of healing and the work that was done by the grace of God. And that mat could be symbolic of, you know, that's where I was, but I'm no longer there. And thank you, Lord, for the healing that you have brought into my life. Mm. And and I, I I love it that, that th- I mean, that's my takeaway on it anyway. There, I, I'm sure... Th- you know, that's whatever, but, um, that's all I can think of, of why that we're supposed to take that mat back home because it it can serve as a beautiful reminder. Um, and well, and it, we could even say it could be your testimony as a part of the testimony that you have so eloquently articulated here today and that you have so graciously shared with everyone out of your own healing and your deep in your heart. Um, I'm so grateful that you have have felt comfortable to share these things and to encourage other people. And, and you've kind of said, Hey, here's my mat. Take a look at this. And this is where I was. And now this is where I am. And um, you continue to point back to the Lord. And that is really inspiring. So thank you so much for your, for appearing here and for sharing your story with, uh, with the listeners here. Really appreciate that, Helen. Well, it's my privilege to walk this walk with you, Victoria, as you use this podcast as a mat um, to point to the work that only Jesus can do. I mean, I, I do. I have the same. I have the same sense of that picture of that man had that mat in the corner of of his room, his living room, and people would walk in and they would say, why why do you have that? And he said, oh, that, Mm -hmm. oh, that, let me tell you about that mat. And that's true. I see that in your life now, just saying, oh, the freedom you see? Well, let me tell you about the journey and how I'm walking in it. And that can be true of anyone. That is the power of Jesus Christ. And I just, I encourage those people that are listening that just want to give up because the work seems hard. The work is worth it. And to surround yourself, don't do this alone. You cannot do it alone. It, the healing happens in confession and community and, and realizing that you're not the only one and that people hear your story and they then are stunned and encouraged. And through that, you continue then to get the strength to go, okay, this, this struggle is real, but I am fighting for freedom because the blessing of that is even more real and it's worth the work. Thank you so much. I have not done this before on a podcast, but would you mind closing us in prayer and just 
lifting up that individual who feels like giving up or who is trapped in addiction. And would you just pray for that particular listener? Jesus, I thank you that your presence is with this person or they wouldn't be listening to this. I thank you. Would you encourage them that you are at work where they're kind of going, God's just not working, but their obedience to just stay with us is evidence of your spirit at work in their life. Now I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would show uh, my friend, whoever he or she is, the right next step the right next person to reach out to, the right meeting to attend, the right counselor to go to. But I pray you would unleash in them a spirit of humility, honesty, and openness to the work you want to do such that the blessing of obedience would be evident in their life. In your name I pray. Amen. And thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Choose to Think podcast. I cannot wait to hear your responses from this episode. Be sure to shoot me a private message on Facebook or Instagram or even go to my website. There's contact information there at www.victoriadwalker.com. I'd love to hear from you. And until next time, Dios primero y que Dios te bendiga. Chao.